Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ Happening Live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers, and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the world. Praise the Lord. Amen. Rise up as we pray together. Let's close our eyes as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this Bible study. I will pray that you bless our souls today tremendously in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray, Lord, that we'll hear you speaking to us. And will respond to you, hearing your words, not the words of men, but just your word. And your word will do good in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. And what you call us to do, what you send us to do, by your grace, with all our heart, with all our soul, without any reservation, Lord, we will do in Jesus' name. Amen. And the blessing of obedience will be upon every one of us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You can be seated. We're looking at Jonah. Today we're in Jonah chapter 3, but I need to back up to chapter 1 for you to understand where we're coming from, what's happening to Jonah, what lessons we're learning from the life of Jonah and from the book of Jonah. In Jonah chapter 1 verse 3, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. That tells a lot of story about Jonah. Jonah was a prophet of God. And Jonah was sent by God to run errands for him. To go for him. To do something for him. To go to the place he will fulfill the calling and the ministry he has called him to. But in this chapter 1 verse 3 we learned that he rose up. And then he fled to Tarshish. He fled away from the presence of the Lord. As a result of that disobedience, as a result of going the opposite direction, as a result of not doing what the Lord had called him to, as a result of trying to escape from the assignment the Lord had given him to do, the Lord sent judgment, punishment at time. Chapter 1 verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. He was not the only one in that ship, because other people were there, and those people were innocent, innocent of his fault. They didn't plan with him, they didn't encourage him, they didn't send him to do what he did, but was part of them. That is, he stayed in that shape of them. A wind that arose also caused trouble for every one of them. So they began to pray. Eventually they found out for whose cause, for, for what reason is this problem upon us. And then they discovered it was because of Jonah that that problem came upon them. And now they asked Jonah, what are we going to do? Because you have fled away from the presence of God, you are living in rebellion and disobedience against the word of God. And now judgment has come, not only upon you, but upon us together. What are we going to do? This is what it said. He told them in verse 12. And he said unto them, take me up 
and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea become unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Uh, have you ever had the experience of staying with somebody, living with somebody, being associated with somebody who is living in disobedience? And the judgment of God comes upon him. And you share in that punishment and the judgment of God. Do you have the uh, kind of experience that somebody missed the will of God? And he ran away from the will of God. And then got married to you, hooked up with you. And the judgment coming upon him. And the judgment coming upon her. Now you are together. Now you are united together. And because you are married together in marriage, because you are united together in family, then the judgment coming upon him as a result of his rebellion, as a result of his disobedience, will come upon you as well. Have you ever joined business with anybody? That this fellow is living in disobedience, rebellion against the word of God. He knows the word of God, the calling of God upon his life. And he decided, no, I'm not going to obey God. I'm going to go into business. And God says, that's not the way. That's not my calling for you. I'm calling you to pick up your cross, bear that cross, and follow me. And this is what to do. And the man says, God, I'm sorry. Keep your work for yourself and keep your cross for yourself. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go my own way. And then you came into business partnership with that individual. And the whole business is ruined. And you lose your capital. You lose everything. You know why? Because there's a Jonah in your ship. Have you ever given accommodation to somebody? You built the house. And then you sweated all that you had. You put on that house. And somebody is running away from God. And he wants to hide inside that house. And he says, I'm renting this accommodation from you. And then you say, why not? Get in here. And you're living there together. And because that's a Jonah in your boat, that's a Jonah in your home, you get into trouble. That's why we're learning what we're learning. It's not enough to say, I am not disobeying God. I am not running away from God. I am not abandoning the will and the work of God. Are you associated with somebody? Are you in marriage relationship with somebody? Are you in courtship with somebody who obviously is running away from the very will of God and the calling of God? What are you going to do when the tempest rages in that family? Eventually, this Jonah made up his mind. He said, I'll fight it out with God. But who can fight with God and win? So he told them, get me up, throw me into the sea. I'll set you over him. Then the sea will be calm for you, and then you can go your way. Verse 19. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then chapter 2 verse 1. Then Jonah prayed. You see, there are some people that will lose a lot of money before they pray. They almost lose their lives before they pray. They almost lose everything they have gathered together in life before they pray. And they keep on struggling with God, fighting with God, arguing with God, running away from God until God gets them into a corner. And then when they cannot run anymore, they say, Oh God, I surrender. Why didn't you surrender before that time? Why did we have to lose all this time? Why did we have to lose all this money? Why does our sheep, uh, why does our sheep need to be broken? And why do we need to struggle and pray and fast and shed tears before we can obey the Lord? But eventually Jonah prayed. He prayed unto the Lord. Is God out of the fish's belly? And then in his prayer, he realized what had happened. Look at verse 7, chapter 2. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. Then he said, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. He said, I can recollect now. Some thoughts were coming to me, and those thoughts were thoughts of vanity, telling me, run away from God telling me, abandon the assignment the Lord has given you. Now I realize, as I look back, and I think through, as to what was happening to me, there were thoughts of vanity. 
And then I took steps of vanity, running away from God. How can you escape from God? Was I not the one that told those mariners that they said the God that made the land and the sea? And he sees everywhere. He knows everything. How could I be so foolish to think that I could run away from God? Then he said, they, not only me, because I have been listening for you. Jonah said, all of us together, if you will copy me and do what I have done, and then you observe lying vanities like I have done, you, you forsake your own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto the Lord. He wanted now to sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. When he came to that point, then the Lord spake unto the fish. And it swallowed up and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Isn't God a good God? No matter how far you have gone in disobedience, no matter how far you have gone in rebellion, the moment you say, Lord, I give myself to you, Lord, I surrender, I will no more struggle, I will no more fight, I will no more resist, I will no more rebel, I will no more flee from you. Now I surrender, I give myself to you. Immediately the answer comes and then he commanded that fish to vomit out Jonah upon the dry land. And then chapter 3 verse 1, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. The words of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. The Lord now called him again and he said, Do you remember what I told you to do before? Now you will rise up and do it. In verse 2, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. This is what the Lord had said to this man. And this is what the, the lesson we're learning in Romans chapter 11 verse 20. Romans chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 20. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Because of unbelief, because of disobedience, because of rebellion, what happened to Jonah happened to him. And you are standing by faith. And you are standing by the grace of God. And you are standing because right now you are still obeying the Lord. But be not high-minded. Don't say, ah, poor Jonah. How could that happen to him? I know myself. It can never happen to me. Be fearful and be not high-minded. But fear. Verse 23. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, people like Jonah, if they do not remain in unbelief, in rebellion and disobedience, shall be granted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Hosea chapter 5. In Hosea chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 15. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. This is Almighty God talking about the children of Israel. The children of Israel were disobeying the word of the Lord. They were rebelling against the word of the Lord. And then the Lord said, I'll leave them to themselves. I'll leave them to their own ways. I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. And they seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. We bring affliction upon ourselves. And we bring torment upon ourselves. We bring punishment upon ourselves because we go the wrong direction. We know the way of righteousness and the way of obedience. And we voluntarily, deliberately choose to go the way of rebellion. And God says, okay, I leave it to yourself. Affliction will come and I will go to my place and leave them alone until they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. Chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return unto the Lord. You see, it's not only Jonah. There are other people too. And these people now, they said, now we realize like Jonah realized. And so now let us come and return unto the Lord. For he has turned. And he will heal us. They understood it was the Lord's hand heavy upon them. He has torn and he will heal us. 
He has smitten and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And in the third day, he will raise us up. And we shall live in his sight. Third day, third day. Do you remember Jonah? Three days and three nights in the fish's belly. And they said, if we will come to the Lord. He may not show the favor. He may not remove the affliction that very moment. But at least we know the second day and then the third day at the most, he will revive us. And then we shall live in his sight. Verse 3, then shall we know. If we follow on to know the Lord, is going forth, is prepared as the morning. And he shall come unto us as the rain and as the latter and the former rain upon the earth. You see, this was the experience of Jonah. He was in rebellion. But now, in the study that we have today, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3, he came to recommissioning. If you look at your outline, the recommissioning of a repentant preacher. The recommissioning of a repentant preacher. Now, what steps did he take? What steps can we take? What steps can you take? Moving away from rebellion and coming to the point where the love and the fellowship of God comes to you again and embraces you. And he loves you. And he showers his blessings upon you. And he recommissions you. Number one, realization. Realization. You see, Jonah realized. He said, I went astray. I didn't do well. Number two, is remorse with regret remorse with regret how sorrowful he was affliction that came upon him and the things that he lost the time that he lost the property that he lost the peace that he lost the joy that he lost the fellowship that he lost the blessing that he lost and the reward that he lost and then he regretted he had remorse with regret number three resolution resolution i will sacrifice unto thee i will pay that which i have vowed resolution number four repentance there's a change there's a turning around i will not go the way of rebellion anymore i'm going to go now in the way of righteousness there was repentance number five there was renewed renewal of consecration renewal of consecration i bring myself again and i lay everything now upon the altar of the lord number six restoration restoration to the favor of god restoration into fellowship with the lord restoration then number seven reassignment the lord reassigned him to that same word that he wanted him to do and the word of the lord came unto jonah the second time reassignment saying arise go unto nineveh that great city and preach unto it the preaching that i bid thee as we look at this subject or this topic today we're dividing the message to three parts number one repentance and restoration of an obstinate minister obstinate minister to be obstinate means to be heady to be stubborn to be self-willed to say i will go my way whatever god will say whatever god will do this is what i will do that's been obstinate but thank god there was repentance and restoration of an obstinate minister number two the recommissioning with the renewal of our mandate recommissioning with the renewal of our mandate number three the reiteration and reaffirmation of the original message let's come back to number one the repentance and the restoration of an obstinate minister jonah was a prophet in the old testament a prophet was a mouthpiece of god a prophet will hear the word directly from God and then give it to the people. That means that God will minister to him. And receiving that ministration from God, he will take that word ministered unto him and minister it to the people. That's why in the New Testament we use the word minister. And so if we're looking at Jonah from the light of the New Testament, we'll call him a minister. But he was a disobedient minister. A rebellious minister an obstinate 
minister. But he came to repentance eventually. That's why we were reading in Jonah chapter 3 verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. The second time saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. When Jonah rebelled against God's will, he stopped, he ceased to be a prophet of God. We need to understand that. When Jonah refused the will of God, rebelled against the will of God, rejected the will of God, he was no more an ambassador of God. Think about our country. Our country sends out an ambassador. And then over there in, the, in that country, he opposes the government of our country. He rejects the constitution of our country. And he openly insults the president of our country. Although he might still be there physically present, he will not be an ambassador for the country anymore because he's openly rejecting, disobeying, and rebelling against the country and the constitution of the country. The same thing, you have been a minister. When you go your own way, and then you abandon the will of God and the work of God and everything the Lord has told you to do. Although people shall say, bro, bro, you're not a brother. A backslider is not a brother, is not a follower of Christ. A person that is following his own will is not following the Lord. A person that is going the way of sin is not going the way of the Savior. A person that has rejected the mind of God, the word of God, and what the Lord directs him to do, that fellow is no more a representative of Christ. And so, as Jonah was rebellious against the revealed will of God for him, he was no more an ambassador of God, a prophet of God, neither was he a representative, a servant of God at that moment. But thank God he received mercy. I said, thank God he received mercy. Amen. But, but, it doesn't always happen that everybody that rejects, refuses the will of God, receives that kind of mercy. Some don't take things for granted and say, all right, Jonah fled away from the presence of God. I am going to have my own time of rebellion. Be very careful. It may not happen to you the way it happened to Jonah. For Samuel chapter 2, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 27. For Samuel chapter 2, verse 27, And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father, when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense to wear the effort before me? Did I give and did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and you honor, thou honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father shall walk before me forever. But now the Lord says that be far from me. You see Eli and his family? I chose you. I chose the people before you. And then I've chosen your family too. That you represent me and be a priest. And then be my mouthpiece and my servant and declare my statutes unto the people of Israel. But you see that your sons are not living right. And you didn't do anything about it. And you leave them there in the priest's office. Now, although I said that your house will be before me, walk before me forever. When I gave the promise, I put the words forever. But now, because of your attitude, and because of your disobedience, and because of kicking at my sacrifice and honoring your sons above me, what I said before, I will draw that be far from me. Look at verse 35. And I will raise me up a faithful priest 
that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind and i will build him a sure house and he shall walk before mine anointed forever look at first samuel chapter 15 for samuel chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 20 and saul said unto samuel yea yes i have obeyed the voice of the lord and i have gone the way which the lord sent me and i brought agag the king of amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, and the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, As the Lord has great delight in bond offering and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to work in the, than the fire of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Look up here for a moment. Let's take this man. He was a servant of God. He was a real child of God. He was an ambassador of Christ. He was a prophet of God. Suppose in that situation as a servant of god he goes into witchcraft he goes into sorcery he goes into occultism well he at that time when he has gone into occultism sorcery and witchcraft will he remain a prophet of god tell me out loud Ah, but rebellion is the same in the sight of God. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And if you understand that if he goes into witchcraft, he cannot remain a prophet of God. He cannot remain a servant of God. He cannot remain a minister of God. If a person then goes into rebellion, into disobedience, into sinning against the Lord in the sight of God, there's no difference between rebellion and witchcraft. That means then a person in rebellion is not a servant of God, is not a prophet of God. A person that is deliberately living in sin is a backslider. And that rebellion, that, disobe that deliberate disobedience is in the sight of God equal to witchcraft. Look at verse 23. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. And what's the next word? Tell me out loud. Stubbornness is as what? And what? Okay, let's take it. Let's take this man. Let's take a woman now. Here is a woman. And she had been a, you know, a real believer, a real child of God. And a worker in the church. And a person that used to receive messages from the Lord and then will give it to the women, women congregation. But now she goes into sin and she goes into disobedience. And then the pastor of the church or the coordinator in the church or one of our leaders, ah, dear sister, what's this? You are better than this. We know you, saved and sanctified. Your life has been a challenge to everybody. How are you doing this kind of thing? Are you visiting this man? 11 o'clock in the night. What do you see people will say? Leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. And she remains in stubbornness. Now, a person that is stubborn, and then you see her, sister, sister, where? Don't you understand the Bible? Because the Bible says stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Suppose you go to a house and you saw a real idol there and she's pouring oil on that idol and she was your house fellowship leader before. If you see her worshipping idol, pouring oil on the idol, will you say, ah, sister, what are you doing? Will you call her sister? Uh -huh. In stubbornness is the same as idolatry. Why are we calling stubborn people sisters? Why are we calling them servants of God? Why are we still exalting them, elevating them, respecting them, honoring them as the respected, honorable ministers of the gospel? Look at that verse 23 again for rebellion. It's as a sin of witchcraft. 
and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the lord he also has rejected thee from being king the point i'm making to you is we thank god for his mercy for jonah but it doesn't always happen that way so don't take the mercy of god and the forgiveness of god and the love of god for granted don't think it's going to happen every time like that i can continue rebellion for 10 years for 20 years i know god is merciful god is merciful but remember Saul. So. God is merciful. But remember Eli, it doesn't always happen that way. He that is being often reproved and hard neck his neck shall suddenly perish and that without remedy. But let's come back to Jonah in the case of Jonah. When the affliction came upon him, then he turned. He said, I've been observing lying vanities. Now, I'm going to seek the face of the Lord. And the Lord had mercy on him. I pray God will have mercy on every one of us. We're looking at uh, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 33. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. In 2 Chronicles chapter 33, I'm reading from verse 10. Second Chronicles chapter 33, verse 10. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hack him. They said, no, we're not going to obey you. We're not going to listen. They were not hack him. And they were told, wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the hosts of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the sons and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God, and he humbled himself greatly before the, before the God of his fathers. And he prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. In the case of Manasseh, when the affliction came, he repented. He yielded. He surrendered. And then God had mercy on him. I pray God will have mercy on all of us. And then we look at Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18. Reading from verse 7. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck, to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced Turn from their evil. I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. You see, the forgiveness is not automatic. The forgiveness is not automatic. It is if the people turn. If the people turn. Uh, look up here. Uh, you see, uh, we, we're deeper life and we study the Bible. Are you deeper life people? Yes. Do you study the Bible? And you know, sometimes uh, somebody commits a sin. In committing that sin, then the word of God rebukes sin. The spirit of God rebukes sin. And what the word and the spirit have already done, then the minister in the church might now say, we rebuke you. But the rebuke did not start with the preacher or with the pastor or with the leader in the church. The rebuke started from the word of God. The rebuke started in your own conscience. The rebuke started by the Spirit of God. And now the pastor or whoever is leading the church might, might not say, this is the word of God. This is the Spirit of God. You are rebuked. And then after that rebuke, somebody will say, Jesus said, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Yes, I understand. That's Bible. Forgive them for they know not what they do. Any of those people that crucified Jesus Christ, when Jesus said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do, did they get saved that moment? No. When did they get saved? On the day of Pentecost. How did they get saved? Men and brethren, what shall we do? It was the moment they came to repentance. That's when the prayer of Jesus on the cross became fulfilled. And then they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent. You see the point? The prayer of Jesus, forgive them, for they know not what they do, will not be fulfilled, will not be answered on anyone until there is repentance. There's no salvation without repentance. There's no forgiveness without repentance. 
we can pray i shall pray you should pray we should kneel down for them lord forgive them for they know not what they do but that prayer can only be answered when like on the day of pentecost peter rose up and he declared the word of god unto them and then he said men and brethren what shall we do repent and then when they repented it says save yourself from this unto a generation and then they that gladly received this word they were baptized and there was added unto them about three thousand souls that was the way not that same day when jesus prayed it was day Saturday at the point of repentance that prayer of jesus was answered we study the bible let's follow the bible let's look at jonah here it was when he said i've been observing life vanities lord i'm sorry i will sacrifice unto thee i will pay that which i vow. i will follow you now i will not follow the way of rebellion anymore then god spoke to the fish he didn't speak to that fish before that time and as bible students let's take what the bible and then he says over here if i pronounce against an individual against the kingdom against a nation i will pull it down i will destroy it if that nation before me will turn from their evil i will not do that evil anymore i will forgive i will have mercy that's why i pray the mercy of god will be abundant upon every one of us today in jesus name but we must repent we must turn because that's the only way of salvation that's the only way of fellowship with the lord and forgiveness with the lord and let us look at jeremiah chapter 26 jeremiah chapter 26 i'm reading to you from verse 12 jeremiah chapter 26 verse 12 then spake jeremiah unto all the princes and to all the people saying the lord sent me to prophesy against this house against the city all the words that ye have heard therefore now amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the lord your god and the lord will repent him of the evil that he has pronounced against you as for me behold i am in your hand do with me at seemeth good and meet unto you but know ye for certain that if ye put me to death ye shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon the city and upon the inhabitants thereof for of a truth the lord has sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears you see jeremiah was a prophet of god he declared to the children of his church of judah he said you are not living right this is the punishment that will come he said of the people repenting they said what kind of message is this from jeremiah then they said kill him and then Jeremiah said, all right, before you kill me, amend your way. Do what is right. Truly, God sent me to you to give you this hard word I am giving you. And the solution is not killing me. The solution is that you repent of your ways. You amend your ways. And then the peace of God will come. The forgiveness of God will come. And fellowship will come again. But I'm in your hands. Whatever you want to do to me, I'm here. Do it to me. But no that if you touch me you are touching innocent man and you shed innocent blood because really god told me to tell you what i'm telling you that's what jeremiah said and so eventually paul said this man is telling us the truth and then they went back into the history when so and so prophesied and he rebuked the city did they kill him when so and so prophesied and rebuked them did they rebel then they now came to their senses that's what we're telling the church that's what we are telling the sinners it is not in fighting with the preacher or fighting with the evangelist or fighting with anybody it is that this thing is wrong adultery is a sin fornication is a sin it is not the person that preaches sin that is guilty it is the person that commits the adultery that is guilty and so don't fight the word the only thing to do is to do like jonah say lord i surrender and when you surrender the lord will pick you up and the lord will forgive you and life everything will change in jesus name amen. don't sleep on me give me a good amen. amen 
Now, when we talk of repentance, what does that mean? To repent, number one, repent of sin. Repent of sin. You see, when there is sin, there's something to do. In the case of Jonah, that's what he was to do. He was to repent from sin. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verse 22. Acts, chapter 8, verse 22. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. That's the thing to do. Number one, repent of sin. Number two, repent of stubbornness. Repent of stubbornness. Let me read it again to you. In 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Number one, repent of sin. Number two, repent of stubbornness. Number three, repent of self-will. You see, that was the problem of Jonah. Sin, stubbornness, self-will. Second Peter chapter 2. In Second Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government presumptuous are they self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. So it says, repent of the self-will. Number four, repent of scattering the flock. Scattering the flock. Uh, recently, uh, they, we, we received um, information from somewhere that this uh, woman, uh, the way she was over there, the wife of a particular local person, that local government, uh, we got information that people said, we're not going to come to that church because this woman fights everywhere in the open in the market and it happened that the husband is a local pastor in that little church in that village so they sent to us and said nobody will come to that church and then somebody who had gone from lagos to that locality to live there uh, nearby here in a not nearby state then came to us and said that place is not like lagos that the people there we go out to evangelize said, no we're not coming look at the wife of that pastor Except they change that pastor, nobody is coming to church. And the church secretary told me and said, this is the report we are hearing about this particular place. You see, we must repent of scattering the flock. A person like that is not gathering together, it's scattering. In Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11 verse 23. Luke 11 verse 23, he that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth. We must, we must repent of that. You repent of scattering. Number five, you repent of scheming like Absalom. Scheming like Absalom. You know the story of Absalom? Actually, Absalom was a murderer. And before the judgment came on him, then he ran away. And then there was somebody in the kingdom of David, Joab. And Joab was, you know, was serving, he had a soft spot towards Absalom and was begging, a kind of a begging a David. And they, they used some methods. They called the wise woman and put words in her mouth, go and talk to David like this and plead and beg and plead and beg. I mean, are you talking about Absalom? All right, let him, you want him to come? Let him come. And this fellow that should have died for his sin, and he did not die, and they brought him back now, then they began to scheme. Repent of the scheming of Absalom. You know, Absalom eventually lost his life, not only physical life, he lost eternal life. He died prematurely. And we should repent, number one, repent of sin. Number two, repent of stop money. Number three, repent of self-will. Number three, rep number four, repent of scattering the flock. Number five, repent of scheming like, like Absalom. Number, number six, repent of scoff and scoffing. Scorn and scoffing. You see, there are people that just come. They hear the word of God and they will not obey the word of God. Here we are sweating and laboring and teaching the word of God, turning many pages of the Bible. And then after the Bible study, just scorning and scoffing. What are they saying? I'll still do what I'll do. That's scorning. That's scoffing. Repent of scorn and scoffing so that the mercy of God will come upon your life and real genuine salvation will be your experience. And then heaven will smile on you and the power of the Lord will work and your life will be useful what are we gaining by scoffing and scorning look at proverbs chapter 1 in proverbs chapter 1 i'm reading to you from verse 22 how long ye simple ones will ye love simplicity 
and the scorners delight in their scorning and fools hit not the tongue turn you at my reproof behold i will pour out my spirit unto you i will make known my words unto you because I have called and ye have refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded, but ye have set at not all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity, I will mock when your fear cometh. You see, that's a lot of those who scoff and scorn. Repent of scorn and scoffing. Number seven, repent of slothfulness in service. Repent of slothfulness in service. Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew chapter 25, I'm reading verse 26. Matthew 25, verse 26. His Lord and servant said unto him, The wicked and slothful servant, slothfulness in service, the wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. In verse 30, cast ye out the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But you see, in the case of Jonah, he repented. In our own case too, if the word of God is coming to you today, the thing to do to say, Lord, I need your mercy, I need your love, I need the fellowship, is to say, Lord, I give myself to you you i will not fight i will not rebel against your word anymore and when you do that the mercy of god will come yeah. the love of god will come yeah. and the forgiveness of the lord and the grace of god and salvation restoration will come upon your life in jesus name yeah. i come to point number two the recommissioning uh, with renewal of our mandate recommissioning with the renewal of our mandate we're looking at jonah chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 and the word of the lord came unto jonah the second time saying arise go unto nineveh that great city and preach unto it the preaching that i bid thee the word of the lord came to him again now that you say you have repented now that you say you will sacrifice unto me now that you say you will pay that that you have vowed all right arise now and go to nineveh that great city and preach unto each the preaching that i told you before isn't it interesting that the mandate given to jonah at the recommissioning did not change it's still the same word and it's still the same demand that god had upon his life you see our resentment will not change the bible our reservation will not change the bible our rebellion will not change the bible god will not change i said god will not change do you remember Many, many years ago at the time of Moses, God gave the children of Israel the Ten Commandments. By the time you come to the judges, the children of Israel revolted against the Ten Commandments. By the time you come to uh, the uh, time of the kings, they revolted against the Ten Commandments. By the time you come to Malachi, at the end of the Old Testament, they revolted. And they just lived the way they wanted to live. And the place was filled with more than everything. And then you come now to the New Testament. From the time of Moses to the time of the New Testament, it's about 2,500 years. Even though they rejected, even though they revolted, when Jesus came, he said, you have heard. It was said to them of old time, thou shalt not kill. I say unto you, even if you don't kill, if you get angry, the Lord deepened it, heightened it, broadened it, explained it in a deeper way. He didn't cancel it. The commandment of God still remained. Even though the people refused and rejected and revolted, the commandment of God remains the same. The problem with many churches today is that if some people revolt against the doctrines of the Bible, then they change the doctrine. But God does not change. Look at it here. <clears throat> God told God told Jonah, he said, Do you remember what I told you to do before? And then you ran away. Now that you have come back, it's still the same thing. It says, Arise, go to Nineveh. That great city. Why a great city? Number one, it was great in size. Great in size. Number two, it was great in sin. 
that is he committed many many great sins number three it was great with souls many souls there and the lord said that's a great city i need you there what i gave you before the commission i gave you before is that same commission i'm giving you again go back there and uh, the lord is giving us that commission again and we will do it Amen. i said we will do it Amen. can i remind you of uh, of our beloved apostle that is uh, peter in john chapter 21 john chapter 21 i'm reading to you there from verse 3 Simon Peter says unto them, I go a fishing. The nets he had dropped before. He said, I'm going back to it again. I don't want to do that thing again after all. I decided I was going to follow the Lord. And then I'm deciding now, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'll still worship God. I'll come to church. I'll read my Bible. I will not commit sin. I'll be following the Lord, I'll attend retreat, I'll attend Bible study, but as for preaching the gospel, as for working for the Lord, once I say bye-bye, it is bye-bye. My dear friend, you're not the owner of yourself, and you're not the owner of your time. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and I've put you in place, and I've ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatsoever ye ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. So you don't have a right to say, I'll come to church, I'll read my Bible, I will, I will not commit sin, I'll live my life, but I will not work for God. You don't have that right, and that's the right that Peter was trying to claim for himself. I go a fishing. And then, eventually, the Lord came to him. Look at verse 15. So, when they had died, Jesus says unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He says unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee, only that I decided I'm still going to go fishing. And then Jesus now said, You don't have a right to do that. He says unto him, Feed my lambs. You see the commission coming back again. And then in verse 16, it says unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He says unto him, Ye Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He says unto him, Feed my sheep. And then in verse 17, it says unto him, the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved, because he said unto him, the third time, lovest thou me? And he says unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Do you see that commission coming back again? And that's the love of God. I said as the love of God. Now do you remember that John the Baptist said, if these ones keep quiet, God is able to raise up stones. And those stones, he'll raise them up as children for Abraham. And they will glorify God. The Lord could do it. But he says, no, I love you. All I'm asking for is shape up, sit up, and stand right. And live by the word of God. I still want to use you. I still want to be a blessing in your life. And I want you to be a blessing to multitudes. But you will do that after repentance. You will do that after you come into full fellowship with the Lord. He could replace you, but he doesn't want to replace you. That's what he did for Jonah. And so as the Lord is waiting for you and is saying, I still want to use you. I pray you will not miss that opportunity. Amen. In Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 19 and verse 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Say, go into all the world, get it done, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Mark 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature. Luke chapter 9. I'm reading verse 60. 
Luke chapter 9, verse 60, Jesus says unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Let the dead bury their dead. Those who are dead in sins and trespasses, those who are dead in this world, but they're still moving about. Let me show you what it means in First Timothy chapter 5, verse 6. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 6. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Those are the dead. They're living in pleasure. They're living in drunkenness. They're living in smoking. They're living in adultery and fornication. They're living in the merriment of this world. They're living in the nightclubs. It says they are dead because they live in pleasure. They are dead while they live it. And yet it says you allow the dead, those who are spiritually dead, to bury the physically dead. But you have a greater work to do. Go preach the kingdom of God. We will do it. I said we will do it. We will not shirk our responsibility in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, and brought them forth, and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. You see, they had been in prison. And instead of being sorrowful, cast down, dejected, depressed, licking their wounds, and crying, why should this happen to us? We are the ambassadors of Christ. We are the servants of the living God. How could these religious people just lay hands on us? On when we have not committed any crime, the, the criminals are there on the street, they didn't catch them, the sinners are there, and the injurious people in society, they are there in the street, they didn't touch them, it's we who are doing good. Those of us who are serving the Lord, then they laid hands on us, and they put us in the prison, all right, if God will allow that to happen to me, no more, I will not preach anymore. You can't do that, you can't do that, because you are not your own. You are bought with a price. You glorify God in your body and your spirit because you totally belong to the Lord. And so the angel came and said, Go and stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Will you do it? Of course, we will do it together. Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 10. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 10. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart and hear with thine ears. That's the first thing. If you're going to really serve the Lord acceptably, happily, joyfully, fruitfully, productively, and in a rewardable way, then you receive the word of God first in your own heart. And you live by that word. It's not only to preach it, it's to practice it. It's to live by it. It's to stand for it. Your lips preaching it and your life preaching it as well. Hear the word from my mouth and then you receive it. Look at verse 16. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Hear, therefore, hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Have we forgotten this verse? That the Lord has given us a responsibility. And he tells us, go and give them warning from me. And tell them, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And that if you don't give them that warning, they will die in their sin. That they didn't tell me. I didn't know. And since nobody told me, I just did the best I knew. The soul that sinneth will still die. But because the soul winner, because the member of the church... 
that knows the truth because the watchman did not give them warning they die in their sin but their blood will i require at your hand then in verse 19 it says yet if thou warn the wicked and he turn not from his wickedness nor from his wicked way he shall die in his iniquity but thou hast delivered thy soul and you know sometimes what they tell us they say but all this preaching you're doing nobody is listening all this holiness holiness nobody answers you nobody cares nobody wants to be holy why don't you stop no we can't stop why can't you stop because we have delivered our soul if you give them warning from me and they do not accept the warning we don't stop preaching because of that we don't say no it's useless to preach because nobody's listening don't talk about holiness all they want to hear about healing all they want to hear is about deliverance all they want to hear is about prosperity tell them what they want no not what they want but what you are preaching they are not accepting don't worry that's not the important thing what we do is to obey the lord and the lord said tell them hear the word from me and tell them if they repent then they're free from judgment if they don't repent if they don't accept they will die in their sin but we the preachers we have done the will of god we have delivered our souls look at verse 20. in verse 20 it says and again when a righteous man does turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity and i lay a stumbling block before him he shall die because thou hast not given him warning he shall die in his sin and his righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered but his blood will i require thine and nevertheless if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not and he does not sin he shall surely live because he is one and also thou hast delivered thy soul we will obey the lord first corinthians chapter 9 first corinthians chapter 9 i'm reading from verse 16 and verse 7 verse 17 first corinthians chapter 9 verse 16 but though for though i preach the gospel I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Can we say that together? Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Can you say that again? Can you repeat that again? You see, the Lord has sent us to preach the word of God. And you know, sometimes when we sing, we, we, we sing without understanding what we're singing. So send I you to labor unrewarded. What, what's our problem when you are preaching the gospel? When you are, you know, you are shouting your heart out. And you're doing everything. And say, but they are not rewarding me. So send I you to labor unrewarded. To serve on page, on love. Unsought, unknown. We sing it, sing it with understanding. We're not paying the ushers. We're not paying the choir. We're not paying the security. We're not paying the children church workers. We're not paying those youth leaders. We're not paying these coordinators here to serve on page, unloved, unsought, unknown, to bear rebuke. When you've done your best, when you've labored the best you can do, with the best intention, and you believe that you are sowing the seed of life eternal, and yet, they say, it's not good enough. And you are, and you are rebuked. To bear rebuke, to suffer scorn and scoffing, so send I you to toil for me alone. So send I you to bind the boost and the broken over wandering souls to work and to weep and to wake to bear the bodies of a world are weary so send i you to suffer not to enjoy but to suffer for me for my sake and you see we're seeing that and then when it comes to ministering and then you're doing something and you're rebuked and you suffer for it then it's like okay uh, the heavens are falling i'm not going to do anything again why are you singing this song then 
The people who compose this, these are not deep alive people. We got here from their songbook. And yet, even though they are not deep alive people, this is what they want. They do send you to loneliness and longing. They leave me alone in this job. I feel lonely. And I'm longing to have friends and well wishes. I have nobody. All the same with hearts are hungry for the love and known, forsaken home and kindred friend and dear one. So send I you to know my love alone. So send I you to live your life's ambition. The ambition, I will become this. I'll become this. I'll become. So send I you. Live your life's ambition. That's the song we sing. I want to sing with understanding and leave it out to die to dear desire. I desire to be this. I want to be a politician. I, you have a work to do. And like Jonah, all that you have to do, go to Nineveh. You cannot be a politician in Assyria or in Samaria or any other place. I've given you a job to do. So send you to live your life's ambition, to die to dear desire. Self will resign. Self will Resign to labor long and love where men revile you. So send I you to lose your life in mind. So send I you to hearts made hard by hatred, to eyes made blind because they will not see. So send I you though to spend, though it be blood, to spend and to spare not. To send, so send I you to taste of Calvary. As the Father have sent me, so send I you. Will obey the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. And this is the calling the Lord has given us. And he wants us to do it with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind. And not to worry what people say, what people think. Whether they reward you or they do not reward you, but you do what the Lord has called you to do. And you know, your reward is coming from heaven alone. Amen. And it will come. Amen. I said it will come. Amen. But when you sing, you sing with understanding. That's the word of God. The Lord is telling us that we ought to do what he has told us to do. I'm looking at 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're looking at verse 2. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own loss shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things endure what? Endure affliction. When, when affliction comes, or you're running away, endure it. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of your ministry. It will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. I come to point number three. The reiteration and reaffirmation of the original message. The reiteration and the reaffirmation of the original message. I come to Jonah once again. Jonah chapter 3 verse 2. Jonah chapter 3, we're looking at verse 2. Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Well, it's so interesting that what well, the Lord was telling this, uh, Jonah, is that the same preaching I gave you before, after you pass through the water, you pass through the wave, you pass through the fire, and you pass through the flood, you pass through those bitter experiences. Now get up. There's not going to be any change as to the mandate and as to the message. You take that same message and you go to give it to those same people you are running from. Give them the message from me. Except they repent, they will perish yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now let's understand that this gospel we are to preach, it doesn't change. It remains the same. And we're going to keep to this unchanging, unalterable message in Jesus' name. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, verse 14. 
and this gospel of the kingdom not another gospel this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come remember don't change it it's this gospel this gospel that must still be preached i'm looking at luke chapter 24 verse 47 luke chapter 24 verse 47 and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations repentance and remission of sin must be preached should be preached in all nations beginning at jerusalem in acts of the apostles chapter 17 acts chapter 17 verse 30 and as times of this ignorance god went out but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent he commandeth all men everywhere to repent that means then the message of repentance will not change that same message the lord gave to jonah and then the people when they heard of the judgment of god then they fasted and turned away from their evil and the Lord heard them. And if they will repent today, the Lord will hear them too. And in times of this ignorance, God winged arch, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he had ordained. He has ordained. Whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. That means then, although the circumstances might be adverse, the message will remain the same. You keep to the original conviction. It may be that the congregation we are preaching to is tough and difficult, yet the toughness and the difficulty of the congregation will not change the message. It must still remain the same, and the emphasis must still remain the same. Circumstances of life actually have a way of softening a man. You know, a man that is, you know, always doing something, and is always receiving the feedback of pain and pressure. When you put so much pain upon the average man, not every man, not every man, because there are some men like John Wesley, some men like John Fletcher, some men like just G. Feeney, and some men like Paul the Apostle, pressure, pain, prison, did not soft in them. But for the average man, the pain, the pressure was soft in them. And they will not be able to preach the original message with the original conviction. But all of us should just follow after the Lord that whatever the circumstance and whatever the situation, we keep on preaching that same word. That's why God called Jonah and he said, Jonah, rise up and go to that same Nineveh. And the preaching I gave you before, give that same preaching to them. He did it eventually. Can you do it? Yes. You will do it. Yes. And so we need to preach faithfully the word of God. What word are we preaching? Because it says in 2 Timothy, come back there, 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'm reading verse 2. Preach the word. Preach the word. What word? Number one, the word of salvation. When it says preach the word, it's the word of salvation. Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 verse 26 Acts chapter 13 verse 26 Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham Whosoever among you feareth God to you Is this word of salvation sent Word of salvation Number two, the word of reconciliation In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 19 to read that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. When it says, preach the word, number one is the word of salvation. Number two is the word of reconciliation. Number three, the word of faith. The word of faith. In um, Romans chapter 10, verse 8, Romans chapter 10, verse 8. But what says it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word 
of faith which we preach without faith nobody can please the lord it's impossible to please god for he that comes to god must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him faith is very important by grace are you saved through faith and so we need to preach the word of faith number one the word of salvation number two the word of reconciliation number three the word of faith number four the word of grace in acts of the apostles chapter 20 acts of the apostles chapter 20 i'm reading from verse 32 acts chapter 20 verse 32 now brethren i commend you to god and to the word of his grace the word of his grace we preach the word of grace number five the word of the gospel acts chapter 15 acts chapter 15 verse 7 and when they there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe should hear the word of the gospel and believe so when the apostles said go preach the word is the word of salvation tell them how they can be saved how they can come out of sin and come to the savior and then there'll be the forgiveness of god and the transformation the cleansing by the blood of the lamb the word of salvation the word of reconciliation how can we be reconciled unto god how can enemies of god become friends of God and become uh, children of God. Preach the word of reconciliation. Preach the word of faith. That they'll believe on the Lord. And when they believe on the Lord, then a change will come into their lives. A change will come in their heart. And a change will come in their lifestyle. Then the word of grace. By grace, I you say through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. The word of the gospel. The good news of the gospel. Number six, the word of life. In, um, if, in Philippians chapter 2 verse 16 Philippians chapter 2 I'm looking at verse 16 holding forth the word of life shining forth the word of life declaring to the people the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain neither labored in vain number 7 the word of righteousness the word of righteousness. Hebrews chapter 5, I'm reading verse 13. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. So the Lord is sending us out and the Lord is saying, go preach the word. And it's the word of salvation where to preach to them. The word of reconciliation were to preach to them. And the word of faith were to preach to them. The word of grace were to preach to them. The word of the gospel, the good news, glad tidings were to declare to them. The word of life that will bring eternal life unto them. The word of righteousness that will put into them, impute, impart into them the righteousness of God. Today, the Lord is speaking to you directly. Have you heard the word of God? The word of the Lord comes to you now. The second time say, arise. Go to your neighborhood. That great community. And preach unto that community. The preaching that I bid thee. You begin to imagine now the houses in that community. The people in that community. And say, Lord, by your grace. In your strength. In your power. Lord, you helping me. With all my heart, with all my soul, I'm going to do what you have called me to do. I will not rebel anymore. I will not disobey anymore. I will not turn away from the commandment of the Lord anymore. Now, I will sacrifice unto thee from the death of my heart. I will pay that that I have vowed. I will no more observe lying vanities. I will not forsake my mercy anymore. I surrender. I yield myself unto you. Lord, I love you. I will feed your sheep. Rise up and let us pray. You will consecrate yourself to the Lord. You will say, Lord, here am I. And you'll actually go out and do it. 
not just to come and hear be not just hearers of the word only but be doers of the word be doers of the word be doers of the word who is that in your neighborhood the Lord is telling you go to them and preach the word to them there Mary there a Jane there and a BC there a Joseph there a Samson there a Stephen there and God said there that Lord said look at her you have been talking to her a long time you didn't preach the gospel to her is there somebody in your office the porter the cleaner the clerk the director there the secretary there you know he's not born again you know she's not born again and the Lord is sending you to her sending you to him and the Lord is saying arise go to that community and preach the word unto her You will preach with your life. You will preach with your character. Then you will preach with your mouth and declare the word of God unto those people. Do it gently. Do it lovingly. But do it with conviction. Speak with them earnestly. Speak with them gently. The Lord will forgive if they will repent. The Lord has raised you up. A watchman. A soul winner. Get up, get going. Go and give them the word of the Lord. That they will repent. That they will turn from their wicked ways. Don't do like Jonah. Don't remain in rebellion. Don't remain in disobedience. But live the life. Live the life. Let your life back up what you preach. Let your life support affirm what you preach you are preaching salvation the word of salvation let's see that salvation lived out in your life the word of reconciliation you are preaching let's see that reconciliation demonstrated between you and the almighty God and between you and your fellow Christian brother sister You have to possess that salvation first. Then you proclaim it. You live it out every moment of your life. And at every opportunity you preach it. To people around you who have not been born again. Don't run away from the task. Don't run away from the assignment. Lord, I will sacrifice unto thee. I will pay that that I have vowed. I will no more observe blind vanities. I will not no more run away from the assignment. I will not allow pain or pressure to change me. I will retain the conviction, Lord, here I am. My life is available for your use. Go and preach the word. Go and preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. 
Consecrate your life. Surrender to the Lord. And when you go out of here, live the life. Live the life. A life of obedience. A life of holiness. A life of righteousness. Don't go back into your witchcraft of rebellion. Don't go back into the idolatry of stubbornness. Say, Lord, now I will serve you. The sincerity of my heart and life. No hypocrisy. No lip service. Yieldedness before the Lord, absolute surrender, total consecration unto the Lord. And do it immediately. Jonah did it immediately when the word came to him the second time. No delay anymore. No procrastination anymore. No running away anymore. Lord, here I come. Lord, I yield. Lord, I surrender. I will follow you. All the days of my life. Your will, your will alone will I do.